Hey guys, so I'm walking to you through a film called Astrology Today that I've uploaded to this channel. And basically Astrology Today was uh, accompanied with a film that I made called The Tao of the Astrological Voyager. And it was sold on DVD a number of years ago, before the days of YouTube getting popular and internet film as, as we know it. So I thought I'd offer it to you for free because I'm just that charitable type of guy. Um, in any case, so Astrology Today is basically talks about where astrology is today and the humanistic movement. So when I say astrology, most people uh, think about astrology um, basically going to you know, their newspaper or magazine and finding out their Virgo, Gemini, uh, and basically looking at their sun sign and finding out what they are for that day. So Astrology Today, for one, was meant to help expand upon how astrology is much more complex than that and also what are some of the modern directions uh, that it's going in. And uh, so that idea of just going to your newspaper and looking at your sun sign, that's actually a bit of a fallacy in true astrology, which really uh, depends on your individual time of birth, um, your birth, location of birth, and you have your own individual horoscope. Uh, so it shows that everyone has a bit of uh, Gemini in them or everyone has basically a, a bit of Libra in them, but they're outputted in different aspects of our, in our lives. And that's sort of the argument that people say is that, you know, if you read some of the signs and you really uh, want to look, you know, think thoroughly about it, some people make the argument saying, well, you know what, you can associate with any of these signs to a certain degree, and some people think astrology is a projection of that. And, and true astrology does not really uh, deny that. It really would say that that is true. It's just outputted in a, in a, in a different area of your life. So uh, one of the major areas that astrology uh, in today's world has, has gone is merging with a lot of Eastern ideas and merging with the, uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of areas in psychology, particularly Carl Jung. So this film was actually done before I actually had gone back uh, further in my studies into more of the traditional astrology. Uh, then later on met Ron Bippus, who is now um, uh, passed away and rest in peace. He was my, what I called my traditional astrology teacher, or he was really a specialist in the art of horary astrology. And, um, you know, so I later on got more into traditional astrology, but, but definitely at this time, before making this film, uh, it was more about, um, you know, looking at astrology less from the, the fatalistic point of view, uh, looking at um, how it's, uh, it shows our path of evolution uh, as human beings and, and uh, more the spiritual path uh, towards that. So, in any case, um, you know, I think there's probably a lot of good content for, for those of you, you know, whatever level you are are with, with astrology, whether you're someone who's pretty advanced in the subject matter or you're just a basic beginner, it's meant to be catered to, to all sort of levels. Um, obviously, there's some things that I would improve with this film. Uh, one, the sound, sound quality is pretty crappy. I made this on my, you know, homemade computer before. Uh, again, video editing was very, very commonplace. This is before the YouTube days. Um, I might at some point remaster this film and improve the sound quality um, that would be a bit of work uh, on that path in part but if, if people like this film enough i probably will actually go through the process and, and, and do that so um so yeah hope you enjoy the film and if there's uh, if you do enjoy it please share it with others so take care What is astrology? To most, mention of the word astrology often brings to mind popular horoscopes found in newspapers and magazines. Based on a particular month a person is born in, an individual can find his fortune and forecast based on his or her particular sign. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Aquarius, Pisces. These are the signs of the zodiac. But is astrology suggesting that personality types are limited to only 12 different types? Do we share our fate with the other one twelfth of the world population? Do we not control our own destiny? Many do not realize popular forms of astrology found in magazines and newspapers only represent a minor introduction to the ancient art. In fact, it is debatable if popular media astrology is an accurate representation of astrology at all, as it is a contradiction to the ancient art that an accurate forecast can be deduced from the birth month alone. In the traditional art of astrology, 
An individual horoscope is based on the subject's unique time of birth, location of birth, and date of birth, giving them their individual horoscope detailing the various complexities of their personality. So I had these kind of in the last few years turned maybe more away from astrology and thinks it's more superstitious because the idea of free will is so strong in the collective in modern day humanity that the idea that anything like astrology or anything outside of yourself might have some influence upon you is uh, rejected by the scientific mind that is so advanced in this communication at this day. The, the beauty and the, uh, the value of astrology lies in the idea that we are connected to the infinite. We are connected to the cosmos. And as the planets move around the sun, as they orbit around the sun and come into mathematical relationships with each other, we can time periods in one's life when the dynamics, the psychological dynamics of those principles, of those planetary principles, come into play in your life. Um, from if you, you go back as far back in human history as you possibly can, all the way back to pre-primitive pr man and pre-literate societies, you will find evidence of a primitive astrology, and that the entire structure of society was organized around the movements of the sun and the moon. They're perfect reflections of who they are. They're incredible. They're such incredible statements that just that alone would be enough to, to, to make most people say, wow if they had the ability to interpret these charts. George Bush has a bundle chart, he has a few, he has no, no aspects that want to go beyond his scope, so he's got a very small, whether you're for or against him, it doesn't matter, you can be very happy that he has this very concentrated focal point where he doesn't have any peripheral vision. John Kerry has too much peripheral vision, they're just the opposite. And these are things that are so clearly shown in astrology, but we can never get this into the public arena because we have too many oppositions from people who, from science, 847 or 387, or I don't know how many scientists signed a statement back in 1983, I think it was, that astrology was bogus. These are people who don't even know what it means. So we have a very bad, a difficult time getting into our, our showing the world what we can really do and what we're really all about. In the Middle Ages, you'd have the Vatican, you'd have the Medici family, you'd have families who spent all of their resources working with Michelangelo and, and Raphael and the painters and the great, the great artists, and they supported them. And there was also this was also true of astrologers, etc. Nowadays, we don't have any of these resources, and art is in the same bad, in a way, is in the same limbo that, that astrology is, even though I wouldn't make any, any equivalence in terms of what, what it does, you know, but artists, how many people make a living with art, and then how many people are artistically inclined, I mean, we have great difficulty in our society giving value and support to things that aren't a bottom line stuff. It all began with man's fascination with nature and gazing at the starry sky. The closest archaeological evidence of systemized astrology began with the ancient Mesopotamians. In an effort to comply with nature, these early stargazers attempted to forecast the best time to plant crops, when to be prepared for natural disasters, and when to migrate. Astrology was universal as it traveled from culture to culture, all adding their unique influences to the arts. Some of the civilizations included the East Indians, Egyptians, Arabians, Greek, Mayans, and Chinese. However, the astrology we have today in the West derives closely from the innovations of the Greeks. The Greeks implemented their mythological symbols in the zodiac as well as refining the use of precise mathematical calculations. Astrology also gained popularity with many of the great minds, William Shakespeare, Isaac Newton, Galileo, and Kepler. But um, if you really go back, I mean, if you look at the Inca, the Aztec, the, the Mayan, the Chinese, um, um, the early Indian civilizations, no, no matter where you go, American Indian civilization, you'll find these same kind of megalithic 
sites and you'll find evidence of a uh, rudimentary form of a primitive astrology that became increasingly sophisticated uh, century after century after century. So. While astrology was highly respected in ancient times, it fell into a period of decline with the Age of Enlightenment. Science and religion became at odds with each other as it seemed one impeded the progress of another. Science challenged the Christian faith when it implied the earth revolved around the sun, contrary to the church's vision that the sun revolves around the earth. Due to astrology's metaphysical nature, astrology was associated with religion and rejected by science. From astrology, the science of astronomy was developed. With the shift in society away from religious and spiritual ideas, astrology fell into the background of common knowledge and into the realms of a forgotten art. Um, I, I think that, um, that we can predict events to any degree is remarkable and uh, significant, obviously. Um, uh, the value of predicting events of course is open to question. Um, I always say with traditional event-oriented predictive astrology that the most you can be is right. But whether or not being right necessarily is helpful to a client is highly questionable. Sometimes it, it may or may not be helpful. I think there are other occasions when it is enabling in some way, or it can hold the client back, or it reinforces their anxiety, or it keeps them dependent on the astrologer. It can actually impair the development of self-reliance and independence, which I think um, is a sort of uh, part of what it means to be an ethical astrologer, is to support the client to becoming independent of the astrologer. Uh, if you, if you, you know, um, allow yourself to be used by the client in a, in a way that supports their neurosis and their anxiety about the future, so that you're always predicting what could happen or what might happen and advising them accordingly. I think it's a way of being enabling, and I think it can actually reinforce some of the fears and anxieties that bring the client to the astrologer that are better, um, a better way of servicing the, the client, I think, is to help them take some responsibility for their fears and uh, gain some insight into what's generating those fears so that they're not so dependent on psychics and astrologers to predict the future. Experimentation did not lend itself to science, if science to, to astrological findings. We weren't able to, to apply a, a scientific method to astrology in any su successful way in, in the centuries back, you know, when we got into the scientific revolution. So people just discarded it without really proving that there was anything wrong with it or anything of that sort. We have the same difficulty with psychology and economics and other and sociology and other sciences, but those difficulties are being handled in ways that nowadays astrology could probably do it too, but we've gotten so far out of sync with our world, with the world in itself, that people just refer to make fun of us and refer to us as people who believe in some ancient whatever that wasn't valid. While astrology disappeared from the mainstream for some time, it was reborn into the popular form we know today. In the spirit of our modern age requiring quick and immediate results, the ancient art was simplified into an accessible and easy form. Magazines, and newspapers, and books began to be populated in the form of sun sign astrology. Although sun sign astrology ignored the fact that astrology requires precise birth data, it communicated to the masses and retained the awareness of astrology in the public eye. Um, it's hurt it in the sense that the public thinks that's all there is. Many of the public, much of the public thinks that's all there is. And so it is entertaining and it is limiting and it does project uh, to a degree uh, an, an entertainment or fortune telling quality to the field. On the other hand, it does make people aware that there is a cycle, there are cycles that go on in the universe and they affect all, all of us. Even though there's only 12 general areas by sun sign, um, there's changes that go through them, and there's, there's cycles that go through them, and, there's, and uh, you have to know a little bit about astrology to know that uh, an Aries is going to have a different type of experience today than a Taurus, than a Gemini, etc. So it does make them aware that people are different, even though it does say there's only 12 different categories. 
if they begin to think, well, um, there's something to this sun sign, and maybe there's something more to it than sun sign, then they're liable to take that next step and want to know, you know, what is my ascendant? Where is my moon? Where are the other planets? What does a, a, a real astrologer, a full-time astrologer, look at besides just the sun sign? So it does bring people into the awareness that there's something out there going on, uh, but by itself, it can be harmful too because people might think that's all there is, is just a sun sign. I'd say that the most skeptical culture that I know is America. It's very, very, America wants to show me the money, bottom line stuff, and it's very, uh, it has a lot of bad faith about all kinds of things. I mean, I don't know what it is. And um, therefore, I think that that, uh, that keeps Americans from really getting good value from astrological readings. Okay. If you're working with people in Venezuela, for example, and they're very educated and cultivated, much often with a level of education and culture which is superior to ours in America, but they're ready to try things out. They're eager to experiment with the ideas that come up in a reading, and they're so um, malleable in a way that they really get a lot out of their consultations. You won't find that same effect in America. However, astrology as a serious metaphysical system had continued to redevelop and improve from the ancient arts. Three new planets were discovered and merged into the traditional astrology. Also, with the advent of modern psychology, astrology began to form a solid foundation and theoretical basis. The humanistic movement of astrology was formed with emphasis on man's free will. One of the greatest contributors to the New Age movement and growth of modern astrology was Carl Jung. The Swiss psychologist and disciple of Sigmund Freud developed his own system of psychology. Jung had studied astrology as well as various metaphysical ideas, particularly Eastern philosophy. In Jung's book, Synchronicity, he had helped to develop a theoretical basis for astrology that astrologers of today still reference. Even in the scenario of working with difficult psychiatric patients, Jung would reference their horoscopes to gain a deeper understanding of their neurosis. Jung had also conducted a statistical study examining charts of thousands of marriages, which helped to confirm traditional astrological lore for marriage signs. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of connections between Jungian psychology and astrology. Um, it's, sometimes people almost equate psychological astrology with Jungian, uh, Jungian approach to astrology, but I think that's really very limiting because there's all sorts of different theoretical models and different theorists that um, have developed uh, concepts that are applicable or can be subsumed within the model of astrology. So uh, I would want to just preface any remark I make about Jung's analytical model of psychology as um, certainly not the, the, uh, the final word in psychological astrology, although it, it is proper. It's fair to say. There have been some. Carl Jung was into it, for instance. He did a study on uh, solar-lunar, I think, uh, compatibility analysis uh, between people. And he's a well-respected psychoanalyst, of course. Um, he did a statistical study uh, on introversion, intro, introversion, extroversion. Another hero of astrology was Miguel Gauquin with his enormous contribution to astrology's scientific validity. The French statistician originally began his study to disprove astrology. Surprised by his results, Gauquin continued to pursue his study of thousands of charts. Gauquin recognized a strong correlation with the professions people fell in based on their indications in their chart. The most well-known one was by uh, uh, Francis uh, Gauquelin of France, who did an exhaustive study on vocations and birth times. And he found statistical significance that people born with certain planets uh, directly above them at the time of born, or to the east at the time they born, rising in the east or just about to rise in the east. If uh, people born had those planets in those sectors, they would have a higher probability of uh, going into this profession or that profession. For instance, if you're born with Saturn directly above or near the uh, eastern horizon when you're born, uh, there's a greater number of scientists who have Saturn in those sectors of the, the chart than other professions. If you're in the military or a writer, you tend to have Mars in those sectors of the chart 
is a statistically more uh, significant level than people who aren't in those professions. This, uh, this test, he and his wife Francoise uh, did this exhaustive study and, and printed it. And the um, various skeptical society, SciScops, uh, Centers for Scientific Investigation, uh, you know, which basically tries to uh, show there's nothing in the paranormal at all that exists, tried to damn the study and couldn't. You know, they, they, they claimed they did, but when you went back and looked at what they did, they didn't at all. They kind of supported it. Uh, but the study still stands as being significant and still valid. There's one research which is called the Gokland Studies that has been replicated in several, cult in several countries and is valid. But I knew Michel Gokland personally, and he was absolutely devastated uh, at one point in his life because he showed his results to scientific uh, to people in various scientific places. MIT went to Boston. He tried to get people to look. They wouldn't even read it. The advent of humanistic astrology had a great impact on astrology's perception, with a greater emphasis on psychology, fatalistic viewpoints of astrology had decreased in popularity. Astrologers of today share a greater diversity and a richer understanding in their interpretations of planetary energy, with traditional astrology holding a more finite, black and white point of view. Astrologers of today recognize factors of suggestibility based on their readings of clients may affect clients negatively. As a result, a more conscientious effort is made to lead clients to more empowering choices. So with psychological astrology, not really, because psychological astrology would be a much broader umbrella term. Humanistic psychology is, a, is the wedding or the marriage of humanistic psychology with astrology. And it's similar to what I've been saying. It's, it's a focus on the um, potential of the individual to actualize themselves toward a, to, to a, to, uh, an optimal state of functioning. Um, it places greater emphasis on, on freedom of choice and you know, one's own capacity to, to, to grow and um, heal wounds and uh, uh, move beyond old childhood traumas and uh, gain insight into oneself and continually deepen and broaden one's self-awareness. So anything that, that promotes that uh, is similar to what we mean by humanistic psychology. This is what a, a psychological astrologer would look at. He would look for how these principles are combined in the chart and how the individual is likely to express them how they express them in a manner that serves them and helps them accomplish their goals in life, or how these, these dynamics conflict within them and prevent them from accomplishing what they're trying to accomplish in life. You know, you may have a tendency to behave in this way, or this way, or this way, to give the, po the range of possibilities, as opposed to being very specific and absolute as if it's fated that you are this way or this is going to happen to you because it's not there is a range of possibilities so we've got to project a more um, measured a more professional um, a, an approach that allows for the individual to express themselves in more variety of ways that are covered by this subject than just an absolute way in astrology the character is destiny well the character is destiny is a result of the choices you've made that defined your character how you handle those hard situations those challenges in life that showed in the chart if you made choices that resolve the issue rather than took the defeatist attitude about the issue that you don't have a choice at all in the end you're a different type of character and you can find people born with the same aspect but those who took the challenge and worked with the challenge and made choices that overcame those difficulties are probably what you would call stronger characters and they have a more successful life because they they achieved the destiny they 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 made the choices that gave them the destiny that was a successful destiny versus those who took the victimization approach and gave up realistically a person can expect to gain a calendar if you will a a look at the future 
that gives you time frames when specific psychological dynamics and issues will arise in your life. And depending on the ability of the astrologer, you'll also get a list of possibilities that could happen during those times, how you might be tempted to react, and perhaps good advice with the anecdote on how you probably uh, could also react and gain something productive, noteworthy out of that situation. So, for instance, if you're under, let's say, a Jupiter transit, Jupiter's coming to your sun, and that would indicate a time where you probably uh, have a lot of opportunities, a lot of proposals made to you, and these can be very exciting. Well, an astrologer might say you're going to win a lot of money or you're going to come across a good job proposal at that point. But maybe a little better astrologer, uh, a more effective astrologer would say during this period it might be a good time for you to put out resumes, go to interviews, you know, pr uh, present uh, an attitude of confidence um, and opportunities will come and look into them and make sure you pay attention to detail that the contract being presented to you is really favorable and it's just not flattering to your ego. So you're getting a lot more advice. But what the astrologer, all astrologers should be able to give you is a time frame of when these possibilities and opportunities are coming to you. I will not make projections or tell a client what to do. I believe that what I do is add insight into their process, into what they are processing, what they are um, developing in their lives, what they're working with at any given time, their response to certain things. Although the principles of astrology are universal, there are various branches of specialization. The most well-known and popular in today's modern day is natal astrology. Natal astrology focuses on an individual psychological profile and individual life path, using the subject's unique time of birth, year of birth, and city of birth, charting the various stages in a person's evolution. Horary astrology is a branch of astrology that focuses on a specific question and its probable outcome and best route for action. It has fallen from popularity as it has long been associated with fatalistic fortune telling. However, horary astrology has held a greater popularity in ancient times since accurate date of births were not known. Next, there is synastry, the astrology of relationships, how the energies of different people blend in relationships, partnerships, and friendships. Another area of specialty is financial astrology. As astrology is the universal forces of change, this not only applies to human events, but other entities as well. The movement of the stock markets can be anticipated with the use of astrology. This can also include the tracking and growth of certain financial investments. What I've done is go back um, and look at every single day the market is traded since that particular market started, whether it's a stock or a commodity or the Dow Jones I've gone back to 1928 and looked at every single day and I've uh, looked at every single aspect that happened and tried to see you know do they correlate with highs or lows what type of percentage uh, reversal tends will happen around that time or do they even happen around that time and I do a, a statistical well a quantitative uh, study to say that you know this percentage of time uh, this aspect is correlated with this average percent of a move in a reversal within X number of days and so I've got it documented in all the books that I've written that you can look it up as reference books that if a certain aspect is coming up you can go look at the last 20 25 times it occurred see what happened and see the statistics you know how it measured how many lows how many highs what percentage reversals happen how strong is that aspect and develop a trading plan around it another branch of astrology is mundane astrology which includes the study of national events while electional astrology represents the best time to move forward with certain plans of actions. The varying use of astrology goes on and on with applications that change, but the principles of astrology remain the same as they are transferable as they are the universal principles which instigate change. What are the components that make up a horoscope? First, there is the sun, which represents the conscious mind. This is the area of the horoscope that people are most aware of. Often when asked, what is your sign, 
Most people answer with their sun sign. I, Taurus, Virgo, Gemini. Next, there is a moon sign. The moon represents the subconscious personality and the emotions. It is also symbolic for relationships with one's mother. Often the moon sign represents the core aspects of a personality. However, the realization of it is hidden as it slowly uncovers as our personality unfolds. Within the horoscope, the ascendant represents the horizon, the surface level personality that others see. The ascendant is a projection of yourself that others see within the first four minutes of meeting you and how you adapt your personality in relation to others. Mercury represents this character style of communication. Since Mercury often travels so closely to the Sun, it is usually in the same sign as the Sun sign. However, in some horoscopes, Mercury drifts off into another sign. For instance, a Virgo Sun may communicate like a Libra, hiding one's perfectionism and creating the need to communicate diplomatically with others. Mars represents aggression, energy, and action. It also rules competitive drive and ambition. On the negative side, an overemphasized Mars rules war and combativeness. Venus represents love, pleasure, and aesthetic beauty, the feminine nature and desire for harmony within all of us. Jupiter represents wisdom, philosophy, and religion, all high-standing ethics and long-lasting principles in life. Saturn represents structure and limitation, all the things that weigh us down and bind us down. Mathematics, law, old age are all representations of Saturn. From the traditional system of astrology, three new planets have been discovered since then. The first was Uranus, discovered in 1781, close to the time of the revolutions, as many social revolutions like the French Revolution and Industrial Revolution and Age of Enlightenment had occurred during those times. This is interestingly coincidental, as Uranus itself represents the planet of revolution, therefore rules all erratic and unpredictable changes. Uranus is also responsible for technology as well, and the metaphor of astrology being in the music of the spheres, Uranus is considered the higher octave of Mercury, as Mercury is considered the mind of man, and Uranus the mind of God as it rules ideas. Pluto rules the underworld. Pluto was discovered in 1930, close to the time of World War II, as World War II represents a time of great Plutonian energy. Pluto is a planet of power. In relation to its symbolism of power, it has the ability to destroy things completely, only for them to be reborn. The nuclear bomb is an example of Plutonian power. It rules extremes of human will. Sexuality is also ruled by Pluto, since it is a dominating force beyond the individual ego. Neptune is a planet of illusion. Neptune is responsible for all distorted realities, such as dreams, lies, and drugs. Neptune was discovered in 1846, as Neptune is considered the higher octave of Venus. It is associated with art, particular film, music, and photography. Now, for example, if we're feeling restless or impatient or threatened and we feel we have to assert or stand up, and uh, set a limit or act in our own self-interest, that would be, that feeling, that impulse, would be the voice of Mars. So just so every planet and sign have a, have a certain feeling quality or impulse that's um, the individual experiences subjectively. Each planet resides in different signs. For instance, the sun resides in Taurus, giving the person's sun sign lending to a personality which favors stability and structure consciously. The moon resides in Pisces, making them dreamy, romantic, and sensitive on a subconscious level. Mercury resides in Scorpio, giving penetration and forcefulness in their communication. And Venus is in the sign of Leo, making their affections proud and forthcoming. This is an example of how an individual can have a complex horoscope. A common argument made among skeptics is that reading the attributes of different signs, often people can identify with any one of the signs. Traditional astrology does not argue this, as all signs are within a horoscope within a varying priority and consistency within the horoscope. While everyone does have a little bit of Libra and a little bit of Leo, the consistency of that behavior varies from person to person.
Planets also reside in different houses that represent different external areas. This demonstrates how certain energies can be best channeled. The first house represents the projection of the self in relation to others, the physical body and appearance. The second house rules finances and possessions. The third house represents communications and commonly used tools on a day-to-day -to -day basis. The fourth house represents the home. The fifth house represents fun, recreation, activities done with carefree expression. The sixth house represents routines such as work and hygienic activities. The seventh house represents close partnerships, marriages, and business partnerships. The eighth house represents other people's money, debts, loans, and inheritances. The ninth house represents travel and journey. The tenth house, career and status to society. The eleventh house, acquaintances and one slighter social circle. The twelfth house, dreams, secrets, and things buried beneath the unconscious. While the planets abide in various houses and signs, they interact with each other planets which greatly affect their expression. The energies may be enhanced or frustrated depending on how well the energies may complement each other. These interactions are measured by the angles they make in relation to each other. The major angles are 0 degrees, conjunction, 60 degrees, known as a sextile, 90 degrees, the square, 120 degrees, trine, and 180 degrees, opposition. Certain angles are more harmonious and others more challenging. These angles represent the various tensions of the mind, such as a 90 degree angle with Mercury, the mind, and Neptune, the imagination, may make an individual predisposed to daydreaming. Concentration may be challenging for this individual. However, channeled creatively through arts, they may learn to succeed with this challenge. Well, the, the whole concept of aspects, uh, mathematical relationships between planets, um, are based on harmonics. Um, when planets are together, I mean, that's basically number one, harmonic. When you get planets on opposite each other, that's uh, the second harmonic. If you, you know, took every sign in its opposition as being the same sign, you get half the zodiac. And so an opposition is like a conjunction. If you take a fourth harmonic, it's like the square, the nine degree relationship. And so we say that the third harmonic, which is the division of the heavens by three, instead of a 360 degree circle, we look at the 120 degree increments. Those are considered soft or harmonious. They flow easily when planets are one-third of the, uh, the universe apart from each other. Uh, whereas if they're a quarter of the, uh, the zodiac apart from each other, they're said to be in square, which is a little more challenging, a little more discordant, it's a little more difficult. So we do look at harmonics, we do look at divisions of the zodiac and the relationships of planets from each other, see if they're you know, together, opposite each other, trine which is a third of the distance or square to each other or six which is a sextile and we give we give meaning to that there's a certain ease or difficulty that goes with each of those mathematical relationships the reason for astrology for its decline was its association with fortune telling and fatalism relating again to our rejection of religion the pride and free will was further emphasized in which capitalistic society and democracy were symbols of that thinking. But exactly how accurate can astrology actually make predictions? While it is possible to make predictions, there is room for error as any other predictive method, such as marketing forecast and economic forecasting. However, with the emphasis on the humanistic movement and a more process-oriented astrology, as undoubtedly subconscious influences may play a result in the client's reactions. The real value of astrology is in full understanding of the meaning of events in a subject's life, how to maximize on the potential of a situation and view it as an opportunity for growth rather than a negative occurrence. Astrology reinforces the idea and philosophy of the individual growing and evolving in the process of individuation as coined by Carl Jung. I try to do things that will make, will be as interesting and as exciting and as legitimately astrological as they can be, which will make their trip worthwhile. In other words, I don't think I can tell somebody something that I don't think is possible, but I can also reframe their lives 
and reframe their their understanding of certain circumstances to give them something that they may not have expected to find. You see, astrology is a tool with incredible resources that 99% of us are not using with our clients. The thing that astrology can give an individual is the possibility of individuation. Now, Carl Jung talked about that in his psychology. He thought psychological uh, work would give people the power of individuation. And I think astrology offers that to people so that we can take ourselves out of what might be called whatever that matrix of habits, that cultural matrix, which is doing what every American guy does or every American girl does, and really looking at our lives as an individual. Some of us have uh, different learning styles. Some of us have different faculties in terms of professional work. Some things are very destiny. There are some destinies in life that I think we could tap into more frequently than we do. Now that sounds a little bit too predictive, but I can promise you that some people, let's put it this way, if a person has been a successful businessman and he loses everything he has at age 40, you can probably be absolutely certain that by age 48 he's going to be successful again because he's got a destiny to be successful in business. The same thing is true with people in marriage. Some people really have a destiny to have happy marriages, and so that's the way it is, and they're fighting some other problems. But they're, so the idea of destiny is part of astrology, but we can't walk there too carefully, too, too quickly, because then we're going to really um, collide with our basic democratic back, uh, backdrop here. Rather than just going through the, the steps of going and doing what you're expected to do, because you're an American guy, you go through, through grade school and high school and college, and you get a career. And it, so at some point, you have to start looking at, well, who am I? I'm not going to be satisfied with the things that my neighbor's doing, or might not be satisfied with doing the same thing. I really have to figure out who I am and where I can really give my life an individual something. Many times we do it through a, a work. Sometimes we do it through our relationships. Sometimes we do it through the communities that we live in. Uh, location is very important, as you learn with Chris, that life offers. You sort of sort things out. Right? And once you get a person to start to sort things out in his or her life, then they begin to have experiences that they were not able to have when they had it cluttered full of all kinds of predictable stuff. Okay, did you get the picture? And as that person becomes less cluttered, sort things out, has different experiences, there's an evol uh, evolving process which allows that individual to do things that he could not do if he were just living in. While astrology has had a long history in the West, it marries best with an Eastern philosophical point of view. Western thinking predominantly identifies a cause and effect thinking style, while Eastern thinking relates to more correlative thinking. A definition of astrology according to Webster's Dictionary is defined as the definition of the supposed influence on the stars and planets on human affairs and terrestrial events by their positions and aspects. To a modern humanistic definition, this is inaccurate since it holds the viewpoint that the stars do indeed have a cause and effect relationship on humans. In a humanistic view, there is a synchronization, a matching movement, as above, so is below, a repeated pattern and rhythm to life in the stars and life on earth. And this is related to an interconnectedness with the rest of the world, yet we are still masters of our own destiny. Jung had published a book known as Synchronicity, which greatly influenced this viewpoint. In his publication, he identified there were no casual coincidences. An example would be when we were thinking about a certain song and turn on the radio and that song is playing, or when thinking about a certain person and that person calls. Astrology matches that rhythm and pattern of meaningful coincidences, matching these correlated movements to life on Earth. Yet we do know scientifically there is a correlation between the moon and the movement of the tides, as magnetic fields are responsible for their motion. With our bodies at around 65% water, why would these effects be limited to the water in the ocean? 
In fact, the word lunatic comes from the recognition that the full moon, Luna, makes people anxious and excited. Astrology doesn't seek to explain the phenomena on how there can be a synchronization, but rather acknowledges that there is in fact a correlated relationship. This is compatible with the spirit of thinking that has flourished in Eastern philosophy, such as Taoism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. I think astrology is much more compatible with the philosophy of Eastern thought um, that deals with the continuity of the soul than it is with Western thought, or I should even say Christian thought, that you have a birth, a life, and a death, and then you go to heaven. And that's it, you don't come back, <laughs> or you go to hell, whatever the case is. Uh, astrology is much more compatible from a philosophical point of view, in my opinion, with the idea of reincarnation and soul continuity. Because if you believe that every moment of time does have a quality and it can be read in a horoscope, then it's not an accident the moment that you're born. You know, you're you because you're born in a specific moment that has a quality to it. And that shows in a horoscope. Every horoscope is different unless two people are born at the same time in the same place. And Yes. And it's, it's not uh, surprising, therefore, that most astrologers that I know, and I know a lot of them, uh, have studied Eastern religion. They have studied either, they have studied Eastern thought, Far Eastern thought, because it is a philosophy that is supportive of astrology. The, uh, the Judeo-Christian Western philosophy is not quite so supportive. You know, the idea that, um, that the chart is happenstance when you, when you say the birth is just a coincidence, what well, doesn't lend itself to believing in astrology, that you're born just because you're born and that's it, and you're going to die when you die and that's it, and there's no, no real meaning to those events. And the planets uh, are um, in some way wedded to, and, and again, often wrongly assumed to be determinants. So as long as astrology was operating in a primitive deterministic model, then um, there was this assumption that the planets determine behavior or determine events on Earth. Now, if in the uh, deistic view, God is the ultimate clockmaker, is very compatible with a reincarnationist framework. If you don't at least consider the possibility of reincarnation with astrology, you're left with some kind of fatalistic, deterministic system. In other words, when you're entertaining the question of causality, you know, uh, how, what is the relationship between psyche and cosmos? You can look at that, you can, you can address that question from a variety of different perspectives. Um, if you look at it from a Western scientific perspective, and a one-life perspective, then it seems to suggest that the planets are causative in some way. In other words, there's like a linear um, causality model that is imposed on astrology and it then makes it look like somehow the planets out there are uh, electromagnetic or gravitational or there's some sort of mysterious And Carl Jung made this statement uh, at the beginning of the Wilhelm Baines edition of the I Ching. He said, um, every moment of time has its own unique quality. And anything born on that moment takes on the quality of it. Okay? So when you talk about a birth moment and what the horoscope is, it's a quality. It, it, it shows you a quality of that moment. And in that quality is a potential expression of this being that's born. His strengths, his weaknesses. Um, the areas of life he may be doing, he could do well in vocationally. Uh, you might even get a, a glimpse of what medical conditions this person might be challenged with. You might get an idea of what kinds of relationships uh, enhance or inhibit uh, his or her growth. Uh, so a horoscope is a, uh, a quality of a moment that's represented in that chart. And, um, and with that are an infinite uh, number of possibilities in personality expression, uh, vocational, medical, relationship issues, and timing of when that chart is being activated by the transition progressions that take place. Yeah, if you look at astrology from the framework that the 
um, in a sense, the um, primary imperative, the prime directive, so to speak, of life is to um, evolve and, and change and, and realize your fullest potential as an individual human being. This is something, this is an idea that really was popularized by Jung and then got picked up by humanistic psychology in the 60s and 70s and so on. And it was, you know, also adapted by uh, Dane Rudyard, who was uh, probably the first real psychological astrologer. If you look at astrology through that lens, then you're, you see your role as an astrologer to uh, facilitate the fullest development of the individual, the client, as, as you can. So you know, you're, you're, in a, you're in a process of guiding and encouraging and pointing out possibilities and helping the client to gain some insight into, uh, let's say, certain self-limiting ideas, pathogenic beliefs, etc., that uh, impair their development, that hold them back, that, that keep them stuck in the reenactment of um, self-destructive and, and, and uh, ways of being. And, and so the astrologer has a remarkable tool in the astrological chart that can enable the astrologer, the therapist, the counselor to accelerate their insight into the uh, psychological dynamics that um, need to be shifted, that, that are holding the client back from making the next leap, the next step into a more integrated state of being. Um, and it, you also can look at the chart and get a sense of what are the possibilities here for the client? To what degree has the client realized those possibilities? What can I say or do as an astrologer with the client to uh, further a process of change, healing, integration that um, enables that client to make a, a quantum leap or even just a small change that maybe plant a seed that will take root later and move them in the direction that the chart seems to be indicating is possible for them to achieve. Okay. The client says you've got Saturn squaring your sun, um, you might become a t depressed and um, and it's probably a bad time to try to expand your business and you might kind of lay, you might think about laying low and waiting for the transit to pass and you know don't do anything out of the ordinary because it's probably not going to work out and you know you give these kinds of advice to clients to help them forego or not forego but to avoid some of the more difficult um, aspects of the transit you know, I don't really think you're helping the client maybe giving them advice and talking about specific events that might occur, but you're missing the point, I think, from a developmentalist perspective of what the real value and the real purpose of those kinds of transits are. Uh, you know, there is a time to do things. There, there are seasons uh, of growth and seasons of uh, turning around. There's summer and winter. You wouldn't think of planting your carrot in the garden in January. You're going to plant it uh, when the season is right to plant it, when the conditions within the universal environment, within the earthly environment, because we're all part of the whole, the same process, aren't we? As above, so below. There's, uh, you know, the, we know that the tides are affected by the, the movement of the moon. Um, so therefore, it's, it doesn't it isn't too much of a stretch of the imagination to realize that all life is uh, rotates around universal principle. Which is basically we have a connection with the universe, and we understand that connection with the the infinite, the universe. I will tell you this: that nothing has brought me closer to God than the study of astrology. It's the, the, the life within the universe having a synchronicity with itself, as above, so below. I believe that we, we can look at life in a very confined environmental way or in a very enlarged environmental way. So an astrologer has an environmental scope that covers the universe or perhaps might even go so far as to cover all time and all space. So it's, it's just um, being able to recognize that we are part of the universe and we are all tied together in a rhythmic process. I'll tell you this, that nothing has brought me closer to God than the study of astrology. <laughs> not religion, not Christianity, astrology has brought me close to God.
study of astrology is vast as one can spend a lifetime understanding its workings. Sun sign astrology is a surface level representation of astrology. However, it acts as a good introduction to the ancient arts. Astrology is an ancient art with a diverse history, yet it has had a flourishing evolution with the humanistic movement. Embedded with the symbols of astrology lies a rich and deep spirituality, archetypes of the universal forces of change and the unconscious. The study of astrology is a tool for greater understanding and self-realization to aid in the process of individuation and the evolution of the self. Ah! Uh.